So I have a very short passage. This is maybe the shortest passage that I've ever preached on. It's just one verse. Isaiah 40, verse 8. It's also a familiar verse. But this is the platform that I want to use to talk about hope this morning. Isaiah 40, verse 8. It's on page 11. 19 in your pew Bibles, and it will be on the screens as well, right up there toward the top. Here's what it says. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now this morning, as I said, as we consider the Advent theme of hope, we're going to talk about the great living ultimate hope that we have and which is contained in God's word. And really, if you want to boil that down, you could say that our hope, which we find in God's word, centers around the coming and the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now, I think that most of you would agree with me that that knowledge of God's word is absolutely foundational to living a life that is pleasing to God. I mean, we we rely on the Bible to, to, to tell us what God's plans and purposes are for us. We depend on God's word to to know his will for us in this life. And, you know, the reason why I think God put it on my heart to talk about this this morning is that because in recent years, perspectives regarding the Bible have changed drastically. Now, don't get me wrong, people, Christians... Uh, still hold the Bible in very high regard. And, you know, when pressed, they would probably claim that, that the Bible offers the best explanation for human life and the existence of evil and, and what is our purpose in the world. In other words, you know, why are we here? But then when followed up with The question, well, do you think that the Bible is um, the revealed and inspired word of our God? Many people today would say no. And I shake my head. I shake my head and I think, you know, people, people don't realize what they're giving up when they take this view. I mean, we see it in society all around us. Absolute truth is is discarded in favor of relative truth. Well, what's right for me isn't necessarily right for you, and what's right for you isn't necessarily right for me, and what's right for me in these circumstances isn't necessarily consistent with what's right for me in different circumstances. Morality is dictated by context and at its worst, even our preferences. Redemption and salvation, these great scriptural terms for what God has sacrificed in order to give us these great gifts, those become things that we have to figure out for ourselves. And so my argument this morning is that this this diminished perspective about God's word leaves us completely without assurance and completely without hope. Theologian William Jennings Bryan said, the Bible holds before us ideals that are within sight of the weakest and lowliest, and yet so high that the best and noblest are kept with their faces turned ever upward. 
that carries the call of the Savior to the remotest corners of the earth. On its pages are written the assurance of the present and all of our hopes for the future. Now that is, I think, a beautiful statement, but I would ask, what assurance and hope could the Bible possibly give us if it did not originate with God? And that's the question before us this morning, and it's, I hate to say it, but it's an all or nothing question. And so my goal this morning, my goal today is for us to see God's word as it truly is, how it uh, articulates and describes and points to our greatest hope in this life. And a good place to start is to discover what does God's word say about itself? Well, God's word claims to be a foundation that will never be moved. We just read that in Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God stands forever. It says something similar in 1 Peter 1, but the word of the Lord remains forever, and this is the word that was preached to you. So God's word claims to be a foundation that will never be moved. God's word also claims to be a vital tool for a life pleasing to God. 2 Timothy 3, we just got done with a series on 2 Timothy, says all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the people of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Or consider this from Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges thoughts and attitudes of the heart. <clears throat> so God's word is a foundation that will never be moved. God's word is a useful and vital tool for life pleasing to God. And God's word is also a guide. Consider Psalm 119 in verse 11. The psalmist says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. And then later on, Psalm 119 is quite long, in verse 105, more familiar, the psalmist says, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. Now, in order to truly appreciate and appropriate the hope contained in Scripture for ourselves, we must first come to terms with both its authority over our lives and its sufficiency as applied to our lives. But before we get to that, let's step back and look at this book from cover to cover. No, I'm not going to read it all in one shot. But let's look at it from beginning to end. What is it all about? I find this so interesting. I'm going to read you two passages, one from the beginning of the Bible, one from the end. Genesis 2. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and no shrub of the field had yet appeared on the earth and no plant of the field had yet sprung up for the Lord had not sent rain on the earth and there was no man to work the ground but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. And the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And now Revelation 21, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. What do I want to communicate with those two passages? One from the second chapter of the Bible and the other from the second to last chapter of the Bible. It's that God's word is first and foremost a love story. It's the story of God who created a people for himself to love. And did you notice it begins in a garden created by God and it ends in a city established by God. And when you, when you think about it, if you think about it in the context of a love story, this makes perfect sense because, because place or setting is important. It provides the, the landscape where love can be realized and, and where love can be developed and, and where love can grow. Well, it was all set up perfectly. It was all teed up for this to run so smoothly. God created everything good. And when it came to human beings, the crown of his creation, scripture tells us that he created them very good. But here's the thing. Human beings chose to rebel against God. They turned their backs on the, the relationship that God desired to have with them. And so conflict entered the story, and we are still experiencing the consequences of that great conflict, the conflict between good and evil. And so we find ourselves now in the middle. The garden is long gone, and the city has not yet come. And so I ask you, where is it that we can find hope here in the middle now that things have become so damaged? Well, the good news is this. God has provided a place. And that place is scripture, the Bible, the written word of God. The Belgian Confession provides this very thorough summary of what we are to believe about Scripture. It says, We confess that this word of God was not sent nor delivered by the will of men, but that holy men of God spoke, being moved by the Holy Spirit. Afterwards, our God, because of the special care he has for us and our salvation, he commanded his servants, the prophets and apostles, to commit this revealed word to writing. He himself wrote with his own finger the two tables of the law. Therefore, we call such writings holy and divine scriptures. See, the Bible, contrary to popular belief today, is not a collection of myths or legends that, that help us to make sense of the world. No, it is actually the history of God's plan of salvation for us, and it is a history that continues to unfold. Now, we know how it began and we also know how it will end, but the plot continues to play out. And here's the really interesting thing. You and I have a part to play in this plot and us entering into a season of Advent where we stand back and reflect on the first coming of Jesus Christ and anticipate the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is us participating in the story. This is us playing our parts. 
But I want to tell you that our view of Scripture could very well determine whether we play heroes or villains in this unfolding story of God. So you must take this seriously. I mean, we need to understand, we need to know what is contained in Scripture inside and out because often the people who think that they're the heroes turn, off to be, turn out to be way off base. And then conversely, the people that don't seem to matter win the biggest victories. Where is it? It's, it's all in there. It's all in the Bible, and we're going to miss it if we don't appreciate God's word for what it is. The confession goes on to explain the authority that Scripture is to have over our lives. It says, We receive all these books, and these only as holy and canonical, for the regulating, founding, and establishing of our faith. And we believe without a doubt all the things contained in them, not so much because the church receives them or approves them as such, but above all because the Holy Spirit testifies in our hearts that they are from God and also because they prove themselves to be from God. I love this last line. For even the blind themselves are able to see that the things predicted in them do happen. See, the Bible determines what we believe, and it lays out our only hope. Therefore, we don't pick and choose from Scripture what works for us and what doesn't. We don't add to or, or subtract from Scripture because that's not going to do us any good either. The Bible is the sure foundation for what we believe, pointing to our Savior, Jesus Christ, that he was promised, that he lived, died, and rose again from the dead. The word testifies to Jesus Christ as the very rock upon which we stand. Yes, the Bible establishes what we believe. It also confirms what we believe. And I want you to know that the deeper we know the story of Jesus, the deeper we will be convinced of its truth. And God himself testifies to the truth of his word through the work of the Holy Spirit. See, the Spirit is necessary as well. God's word and God's Spirit work together. We don't truly experience one without the other. Word and spirit work together to draw us closer to God. And we can put our trust in this reality because we know that God is good. We can put our trust in this reality because we know that God wouldn't keep from us necessary information, information that we need to know. Now granted, he doesn't make everything known to us, I'm pretty sure that no one of us could even handle all that information, but we can be sure that he has given us everything that we need in order to seek him and to receive salvation. The last little quote from the confession I want to read deals with this. It deals with the sufficiency of scripture. We believe that this holy scripture contains the will of God completely and that everything one must believe to be saved is sufficiently taught in it. For since the entire manner of service which God requires of us is described in it at length, no one, not even an angel from heaven, ought to teach other than what the holy scriptures have already taught us. Since it is forbidden to add or subtract from the word of God, this plainly demonstrates that the teaching is perfect and complete in all respects. Therefore, we must not consider human writings, no matter how holy their authors may have been, equal to divine writings. Nor may we put custom, nor the majority, nor age, nor the passage of time or persons, nor counsels, or decrees, or official decisions above the truth of God, for truth is above everything else. 
Now, those are very, very strong words. Those are challenging words to believers living in the context that we do. These are confrontational words. Strong words, but God has called us to be a strong people. And the kind of strength, actually, that he requires from us, the strength to be bold and confident and stand upon the promises of God as we find them in his word, that strength is actually found in God himself. It originates with God through his spirit and through his word. Yes, God's word is inspired it's authoritative. It's sufficient. In it, we find the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is our only hope in this life. As I finish up this morning, I want to tell you a little story that I heard years ago. It was so powerful to me, so powerful to me that I hope that I can read it without getting emotional, but... There was this guy who lived in a prison, or he didn't live in a prison camp, he lived close to a prison camp in North Korea. And one day he had the, the good fortune of, of meeting one of the generals who was charged with overseeing that prison camp. And he offered this guy employment. Now that sounds like a good thing, but let me continue with the story. This guy's job was to climb down into the soldiers' latrines and shovel them out once a week. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Well, one day, while cleaning, he came across this piece of paper that was written in his own language. One of the officers had used it as toilet paper. Well, the guy was pretty curious, I'll give him that, but he took the paper home with him and he cleaned it off and it turned out that it was a page from the Bible. It was a page from the book of Isaiah, which our verse came from this morning. Well, this guy studied it and studied it and then he shared it with his family and his friends in the village and from that day forward, the man went to work each week and searched for other pages that he could salvage. And he brought these treasures home and he painstakingly washed them off and he shared these life-giving words with his friends and his family. Now at some point, as the story goes, this man left North Korea and emigrated to China and soon after he did, this missionary that was serving in China met this man and started to tell him about Jesus. And so he invited the missionary to his home, and he took this box from the shelf. This box from the shelf. And he opened it. And inside was this little, small, little package of papers and turned out that this was his toilet paper Bible, kept and read and treasured and shared. It had become his family's most valuable possession. Rightly so. For the Bible tells us about the most amazing love gift in the history of the world. It tells us how Jesus came and gave his life so that we sinners could be saved. It tells us that Jesus will one day come again and make everything new. Now God gives us the gift of his word so that we can enjoy him forever by faith in his son, Jesus Christ. He gives us his word so that we can live this life here and now with all the assurance and confidence that we need. So brothers and sisters, let us rest this morning on these great promises contained in God's word where we find certain hope for today, certain hope for tomorrow, and for all of eternity. Amen. Let's pray.